I just taste return to it? Do I just taste return to make it go down? Just one. Oh, this is okay. Is that right? Oh, ground. I got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, delighted to be here as usual and to see so many familiar faces and so many not familiar faces, which is a good thing that the, the, the scene has widened, so to speak. Um, thank you, Fiona, for that introduction as well, just to say about the conference in Cork on Friday on enforcing EU environmental law. The only reason we can do it again for the fifth year is thanks to the generous sponsorship of the Department of the Environment, which is due in no small part to Fiona Quinn and her colleagues. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that because without the department, many of these events simply wouldn't run. Um, tough act to follow, two very tense and intense presentations there with a lot of very important issues raised. So what I propose to do really is to give an overview of the current state of play in Ireland insofar as that is possible. And many of you will have heard me speak on this broad topic before and will have also heard me say that this is very much a moving target. It's very difficult to pin down exactly where our host might be leading Ireland. And it's quite fascinating if you have the time to really get into it. And I'll say a little more about that in a moment. Very briefly, uh, the Aarhus Convention, as many of us will know, is international law. That raises all sorts of interesting difficulties insofar as Ireland is concerned. And there are some important misunderstandings that have surfaced there. Just to be clear, international law under the Irish Constitution does not automatically become part of Irish domestic law. That will only happen if the Oireachtas, the elected parliament, says that the Aarhus Convention is part of Irish law. And our Oireachtas, in its wisdom, has never done that. What it has done instead is it has made law attempting to give effect to certain aspects of the Aarhus Convention. And that is a very important point of distinction with other jurisdictions where international law sometimes becomes part of the national legal system automatically. That is not the position in Ireland. The Aarhus Convention remains as international law. But why it's interesting for us is because, as previous contributors have said, the Aarhus Convention is now part and parcel of EU environmental law. Ireland is, of course, a member state of the European Union, so by virtue of Ireland's EU membership, the Convention, which is international law, does have an impact in Ireland, but only via EU environmental law. That all sounds very legalistic and very complicated, and it is, and that's simply the position. There's no simpler way of explaining it, but it's a very important opening remark, the interaction between international law and EU law and how both of those fit with the Irish legal system. Putting things very simply, in so far as one can, Aarhus and EU environmental law effectively give us a set of standards, international standards and EU standards. And the question then for us is to what extent Ireland meets those standards and any potential flashpoints that might be encountered along the way. It can get very complicated when the three of them collide. And this is my homemade Venn diagram which shows that Aarhus is there as international law, EU law is there as EU law, and then we have the Irish legal system. And as I said, because Aarhus is also part of EU law and Ireland is part of the European Union, the three do come together and create all manner of interesting legal problems, problems to which there aren't always very simple, straightforward, easily explained solutions. But that is the best representation I've come across so far as to how this actually works out in practice. That's complicated, but then, as other speakers have also noted, it becomes even worse when you think about the, difference, the different enforcement mechanisms. We have, um, as previous contributors said, we have the Aarhus Compliance Committee, which sits in Geneva, busily enforcing and ensuring compliance with the Convention. We have the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. The Court of Justice sits in Luxembourg. It's a court of law. Its decisions are binding. And it has played a very powerful role indeed in giving teeth to many aspects of the Aarhus Convention. So the role of the Court of Justice is, dare I say it, almost even more significant than that of the Aarhus Compliance Committee, um, with excuses to Yendry here, because it is a court of law whose rulings are binding. Uh, as opposed to the Compliance Committee who makes findings and recommendations, which of course have political and diplomatic clout and may well be persuasive, but they are not binding judgments of a court of law. 
And then, of course, we're used to the Irish scenario where we have a multitude of public authorities and, of course, our own national courts, in particular the High Court and Supreme Court in the context of judicial review, who are also busily giving effect to the Aarhus Convention and also, of course, EU environmental law as well. And what is interesting, and other speakers have referred to it, is how decisions of the Compliance Committee interact with judgments of the Court of Justice and how they both interact then with decisions of the Irish courts. And there can be a lot of interesting digressions and some coming together as well, of course, between all of those. But the position is not simple. And that is something we have to accept, that this isn't the most straightforward area of law and that there won't always be a nice, neat, simple, straightforward, predictable solution to many of the issues that come up and come across our desks on a daily basis, whether we're practicing lawyers, NGOs, um, government officials, judges. It's simply not straightforward. So then, sometimes I think we forget that in Ireland we had a lot of the Aarhus rights before we ever came near Aarhus. And just to be clear, we did in Ireland have quite significant rights of access to information, access to planning files, for example, access to certain EPA documentation. That was always the case. We also had fairly extensive provision for public participation as well, a legally recognised right to comment or object, for example, to a planning application. Fairly simple and straightforward, but again, vitally important to democracy and good environmental governance. In sharp contrast to the UK, there is, of course, a third-party right of appeal to onboard Planola in quite a number of planning decisions taken by local authorities. Other jurisdictions would kill for that kind of a right, so we need to be careful to appreciate what we have as well. And of course, ever before Aarhus, we, have, we had and still do have judicial review in this jurisdiction, and of course, very important, very powerful statutory provisions that effectively, effectively give any person the right to seek a judicial remedy in the context of enforcement, whether it's planning enforcement or enforcing some sort of environmental license or consent. So the question then for us is, well, what, if anything, has Aarhus added to all of that? And here again, the picture does begin to get quite complicated. Putting it very simply and very briefly, in terms of the right of access to information, Aarhus brought an EU directive. That directive has been transposed into Irish law, so people have rights under that particular pillar and, in turn, the Environmental um, Information Directive. We also, of course, have the participation pillar, which led to the public participation directive that talks about the right to early and effective participation when all options are open. These are very important, very basic rights, of course, when local communities, for example, want to make sure that their voices are heard and heard in good time when potentially unpopular development plans um, come on the horizon. And finally, then, as regards the third pillar, access to justice, where that has really had most impact, certainly in terms of litigation in Ireland, is very much around the, what was Article 10A of the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive, the right to review procedures at a cost that is not prohibitively expensive. Even though it's really come up mainly in the context of the EIA Directive, that right also applies to the IPPC, now the Industrial Emissions Directive, and what the EPA does in the licensing context there as well. That is sometimes forgotten. And then, finally, as other contributors have said, there is Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Convention. That is one area where the European Union has not made a directive or has not made a particular piece of EU legislation. And as another contributor said, Aarhus Article 9.3, which is a general right to enforce environmental law. Um, that right is not directly effective, but what we've heard from the European Court of Justice is that the national courts must interpret national law as best they can so as to give effect to the rights set out in Aarhus Article 9.3. And that, as we'll see shortly, is incredibly significant, even though it comes via the Court of Justice. This is a moving target. Um, I have my question marks here. There are so many unanswered questions. And I apologize that people can't see the slides. Um, there's nothing I thought about trying to lift it up onto the table or something. But um, I just, I'm just going to press on, even though I, I, I really do apologize to the people at the back who can't see. Anyway. Um, what has the impact been of Aarhus and EU law on national law? Well, the impact has been quite powerful so far. I'll say a little more in a moment, but there is still an awful lot of uncertainty. And what that means is that it's just really difficult to advise with certainty. 
whether you're a lawyer, whether you're somebody like me trying to teach this to undergraduate and postgraduate students, your heart will be broken from trying to explain what the law actually is, not to mind what's likely to happen down the line. The sheer unpredictability, even of things coming out of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, uh, is quite staggering, to be frank. Um, this is another diagram just designed to lighten things up a little bit, that you're not alone if you feel this is a bit confusing, this is a bit perplexing, you're in good company. Even the judges themselves, even the Court of Justice, you know, admit that this isn't the most straightforward area of law. And I think we need to acknowledge that, and that events like this, events supported by the Department of the Environment, as I said, and organised uh, brilliantly by the Environmental Pillar, it's about bringing people together to try to tease out what these issues are and try to move things forward as best we can. But Aarhus and all of these issues have been problematic in all of the other jurisdictions as well. The UK have struggled and are struggling, being hauled before the Compliance Committee. I'm sure that's not pleasant. But at the same time, there are issues to be teased out. And we're just in there with everybody else. It's not an exclusively Irish problem. Um, there are some useful sources of information, and I put this out. Many of you will be aware of this. Some of you perhaps not. There is a very, very good implementation guide to the Aarhus Convention, now in its second edition. It's published on the compliance, well, on the Aarhus website. It's not legally binding, but it's been recognised even by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg as being a useful interpretive aid. It gives you some solid guidance, some nice practical examples, and is helpful in terms of spelling out what could well be otherwise very cryptic provisions of the convention. And I think that might be an underused tool in terms of people who might not necessarily have a legal training, for example. But what has really taken off, I think, is the role of the courts, not just in Ireland, but also, of course, at EU level. And we have seen the European Court of Justice gradually grapple with fairly cryptic provisions of the Aarhus Convention and attempt to spell out what they mean for the EU and what they mean then for the 28 individual member states. But this has been a very gradual process and this is an ongoing process. Even the issues around costs, we have a long way to go in terms of getting certainty as to what exactly not prohibitively expensive costs means in the Irish context. I use this slide to demonstrate a point that other contributors made, I think in particular the very telling slide from our colleague from the UK who showed the few common law jurisdictions and then the other jurisdictions. And this is simply to demonstrate that all the member states of the EU have their own different way of doing things in their judicial systems, in their planning systems, the way they resolve disputes. So it's very difficult to find a one-size-fits-all and when the European Court of Justice is called upon to interpret Aarhus and called upon to interpret EU directives, whether we like it or not, the European Court of Justice has to keep the 28 different legal systems in mind and has to try to craft general principles. So when we read cases like Edwards, the UK costs, well, one of the UK costs rulings, you think, well, could they not have been a little more specific? But that's probably the best we're going to get from the Court of Justice, because if they were too specific, how then would the general principles apply in all of the 28 member states? That, again, is simply a hard fact of life when you're dealing with multiple um, legal systems with very, very different approaches. So even though my task here was to talk about the impact or the state of play as regards Aarhus in Ireland, there's simply no getting away from the fact, in my view, that really an awful lot of the current developments and the interesting things are happening in Luxembourg in the European Court of Justice. Um, the court has grappled with a very, well, a very significant number of Aarhus-type cases so far. Just a few of the snappier points coming out of the court's rulings. In a case called LZ, the Court of Justice confirmed that the Aarhus Convention is an integral part of the EU legal order. That's fundamentally significant from an Irish point of view because that's effectively how Aarhus makes its way into the Irish legal system via our obligations under EU law. So even though that sounds sim simple, that is fundamental. Um, the court has also confirmed that when you're interpreting EU environmental directives, directives designed to implement Aarhus at EU level, you must interpret those directives in light of the Aarhus Convention. And again, that's from a case called Crisan, which I can't pronounce properly, excuse me, but Crisan. But it's, a, it's another important point that Aarhus is used to interpret EU law. If there's a gap between what Aarhus requires and what the EU directives set out, Interpretation can sometimes be used to bridge that gap. 
The Court of Justice has also said some other very important things. Um, it has said very clearly, and I mentioned this a moment ago, that when you're looking at the Aarhus Inspire Directives, that would be the Directive on Access to Information and the Public Participation Directive, we must interpret those in light of the objectives of the Aarhus Convention and in light of its general scheme. Now, the objectives of the Convention were covered very well by a previous contributor, and just to be clear again, that it's about environmental protection. It's about the public interest in environmental protection, and it gives a very strong and special role to environmental NGOs. These are fundamental principles, and these principles are gradually beginning to make their way into the Irish legal system as well. Lawyers will be familiar with the expression, a strong purpose of approach. Uh, that simply means that the court should interpret a provision to give effect to its overall aims and objectives. Like, what is this particular provision designed to achieve, and can we make it really achieve that particular purpose or result? But the court of justice is always highly pragmatic. You know, it won't overextend itself unless it can follow through. It won't push the boat out too quickly for fear that it might cause ructions throughout the 28 member states. So while the court is strong in Aarhus, it's also quite cautious in terms of how it's moving things forward. It's a gradual, slow process, and things are being given a chance to bed down through the court's pragmatic and cautious approach. But at the same time, the Court of Justice, being the Court of Justice, is still very keen to ensure that in practical terms, these rights actually have some meaning. And the mantra of effectiveness of the Aarhus rights in practice comes across very strongly in all of the judgments where the Court of Justice has dealt with Aarhus-related issues. And that Crisan case is one very powerful example of that. Um, a final theme, and probably one of the most important themes that you can't avoid seeing in the Court of Justice case law, is their constant, constant referencing of and underlining that this is about the public interest in environmental protection. The public interest in environmental protection. And if you accept that as the grounding principle, that leads to all sorts of other interesting things as regards standing, as regards costs, and as regards the standard of judicial review where challenges are mounted to environmental and planning decisions. Um, what has caused most fuss, really, and what has generated an awful lot of interest in Ireland, and obviously in the UK, is the ban on prohibitive costs that you find in Article 9.4 of the Convention, which is replicated, of course, in the EIA Directive and, indeed, in the Access to Information Directive as well. Um, one of the advocates general at the Court of Justice has called this the obligation of costs protection, that people who are trying to protect the environment in the public interest, for example, should not be deterred or prohibited from bringing an environmental challenge on the grounds of cost. That's putting it very simply, too simply probably, but at least it's a start. And again, in these costs judgments uh, that have come from the Court of Justice, you're back again to this public interest in environmental protection. Edwards would be the most significant decision so far, but there is also a very significant opinion from Advocate General Cocotte in Commission versus the United Kingdom. Um, we don't have judgment in that particular case yet. I'm not sure if there's an indication when that might be delivered, possibly in the new year, but obviously that is something that Ireland will watch closely, given that we are as well a common law jurisdiction. And again, um, from a government point of view, a lot of rather unsavoury reading or you know, um, worrying reading in the Commission and UK judgment. One thing that has cropped up um, at last, we've been waiting for it for a while, is what is it about the standard of judicial review? The Aarhus Convention, putting it very simply, talks about review of the substantive and procedural legality of decisions. That would be decisions taken by public bodies, planning decisions, environmental decisions. And in Ireland, as you're probably aware, the courts tend to be rather deferential, dare I say it, towards decisions that are taken by expert public bodies, like, for example, on board Planola, like, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency. And there is a very, very recent Court of Justice ruling in a case called Altrip, very recent, where really for the first time under an Aarhus-type regime, the Court of Justice has looked to some extent at the standard of review and said some very interesting and I thought rather unexpected things, which I think 
putting it very simply for now because time doesn't allow a more detailed discussion, but what the Court of Justice says in the Altrip case may well grate against or create a tension with the classic O'Keefe principles that we have tended to apply here in this jurisdiction, O'Keefe being the classic statement of the standard of judicial review in planning and environmental cases, where the courts place a fairly high onus on the applicant who's seeking judicial review, whereas Altrip seems to me uh, to turn that almost on its head. So I think the Altrip O'Keefe interaction is going to be something very interesting. Not entirely clear, obviously, in case anybody tries to hold me to that, but something that's certainly going, the well-informed are laughing, and rightly so. This is going to be fascinating um, as this thing um, moves in a particular direction. Uh, just very quickly to wrap up a few other points, we heard mention of the Aarhus Compliance Committee before. It's not a court. Um, sometimes there's a sense out there that people think they're going to get justice from the Compliance Committee in the sense of a binding court order that they, they can then enforce. That's not really how it operates. Uh, it's a far more diplomatic, far more political type entity, and I don't mean political in a bad way. Um, it operates, though, in a very transparent manner. If you look at its website at all, all of the documentation is there, what one party says, what the state says in response. A very, very sharp contrast with how the European Commission operates when there are infringement proceedings, for example, uh, against a member state. And I think that transparent manner in which it operates is really positive and is, you know, sets a very high standard for how these things should be done. I've said already it makes findings and recommendations, but a word on the impact of its findings and recommendations. They are simply findings and recommendations. A ruling, or it's not even a ruling, I shouldn't say that, I'm making my own point as regards the confusion. The, the findings and recommendations of the Compliance Committee, for example, if it were to make in due course, if it were to make in due course a finding against Ireland, that ruling would not be binding in an Irish court. It's simply a matter of international law. It would have some perhaps persuasive value. But to be clear again, it, it's nothing like a ruling, say, of the European Court of Justice. It's a different entity. And if we do nothing else today, just to try to get those issues out in the open and tease them out a little more, I think would be very useful because misunderstandings about the, the legal value of certain things um, is something we need to address fairly quickly. Um, so then a few wrap-up points, uh, again just to be clear because I'm the only speaker from Ireland today, that since Ireland ratified the convention um, back in September, sorry in June, it was June wasn't it Fiona, it was June, June 2012 excuse me, and it came into force then for Ireland in September 2012, there was a year grace period so to speak during which members of the public could not bring communications or complaints to Geneva concerning Ireland. But that period of grace expired on the 18th of September 2013. So the door is open now, so to speak, um, in terms of people lodging communications with the Compliance Committee regarding Ireland. And that, as you see from the date, is a fairly recent development. Um, again, just talking about the state, state of play in Ireland, where really an awful lot of the attention and an awful lot of the fuss as regards the impact of Argus in Ireland has happened is very much around access to justice and specifically around costs, which has been pretty much the case in the UK as well, although information in particular has got a lot of traction in the UK also. But costs really is where we've had so much litigation here. Putting it very simply, just to bring everybody up to speed, we of course have the Planning and Development Act, Section 50B, and we have now more recently Part 2 of the EMP Act of 2011, which set out the special costs rules, that the default position whereby in ordinary cases, if you lose, you pay the other side's cost, simply doesn't apply anymore in specific types of environmental claims. That is a huge change and a very significant change. But as many of you will be aware, in practical terms, that whole move to address the issue of prohibitive cost has unfortunately generated a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unpredictability. And things are still in the process, unfortunately, of trying to bed down. And we have had multiple very recent high court decisions attempting to interpret these costs rules, and they certainly haven't made things any easier uh, for anybody dealing with this area. But to conclude with a few new challenges, just to throw these out, the incredibly fast pace of development is quite frightening. Trying to keep up is incredibly difficult, and that is what all of the member states and all of us are attempting to do. 
I don't think you can overstate the problems that are caused for everybody by the lack of certainty and the lack of predictability. You literally don't know what is going to come next. Um, and the Court of Justice really has been pushing the boat out quite substantially on a lot of these issues. The problem then, of course, is that national legal systems, and I'm not only talking about Ireland here, almost by nature are slow to respond. You can't just snap with a response of new legislation. Things have to be carefully thought through so that there is a, a gap, so to speak, while national legal systems attempt to respond to rulings from Luxembourg, for example, and also, of course, compliance committee findings and recommendations. All of this has been made even more complicated by reason, of course, of the economic context, and it wouldn't be fair to finish this talk without mentioning that. Are the resources there to support the Aarhus rights, particularly around enforcement, thinking of local authorities and illegal dumping, other types of environmental crime, thinking specifically here about the Environmental Protection Agency and its enforcement efforts. Again, if in a time of economic hardship, so to speak, resources are scarce, to what extent then is there a reduction in the enforcement effort with potential knock-on consequences in terms of the public interest in environmental protection? I think that's a very serious issue myself. And again, it links in with Article 9.3 of the Aarhus Convention and the idea that the citizen now should be able to step up as an enforcer, that the citizen should be able to go directly to court, that you don't have to sit back and wait for um, the public authorities, like the local authorities and the EPA, the traditional environmental enforcers. And the recent enough Holly Hunter case that some of you would have come across is really important in this particular context, the citizen taking enforcement action without fear of liability for costs because of the new costs rules. Future directions, I'm repeating myself, but um, I'll skip through it quickly. The case law is going to keep coming. Things are going to keep coming from Geneva. Things are going to keep coming from Luxembourg. And hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, we will get the legal certainty and predictability that we so desperately need. But we're not there yet. We need more information and awareness around Aarhus and about EU environmental law and environmental rights more generally for everybody the public, environmental NGOs, public authorities, government officials, and of course the judges. And that's why it's great to have such a good mix of people here, people who are informed about the recent cases from Geneva, from Luxembourg, from the Irish courts, to be able to discuss in an informed and constructive manner what all of that means for the Irish scene. Um, so just, this is practically my last slide. I would call what's happening here today a network of collaboration, which will hopefully um, come into its own during the discussion, where everybody um, has something valuable to say and their own particular experiences of trying to enforce Aarhus or trying to implement Aarhus, whatever side of the fence you happen to be on. But this is an ongoing dialogue. And again, there's a lot that all of us can learn from simply engaging with each other and talking about our experiences. As regards public engagement, um, I'm a novice myself, but I do think that social media has quite a lot to offer here. It's fast, it's cheap, and it's user-friendly. And Twitter, I think, is a very good way of getting the message out. We have started using it at UCC under that particular um, in ENV Justice UCC. When new cases come up, we, we tweet saying, oh, this is a new case, here's the link. We find that very useful. And also on Friday at our conference in UCC, we're going, we plan to tweet from the event because we have some people who simply can't make it. And again, trying to spread um, the news, so to speak, about new cases, new developments, interesting things that are happening. But my final slide is, Aarhus really isn't going to make much of a difference without the political will to deliver on what it requires. And political will here means not just government or the Department of the Environment or any government department, but all of us to bring pressure to bear on wherever the pressure needs to be brought, including in all of that the judiciary, and that links back very much to the awareness point as well. And I, I like this, I've seen this before, um, the pillars, uh, very attractive uh, graphics here, this working to find solutions, and I think all these little people working together like us to find solutions really is the way to go and that events like this are, are absolutely essential. Uh, so that essentially is all I have to say. Hopefully there's something of value there. My apologies again to people who didn't see the slides but I'll make them available to Michael so he can circulate them and thank you very much for your close attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you.